A lot of people ask the question, did I ever consider quitting? Well, yes. On three occasions specifically, I was done, I was coming home. Plenty of other occasions, I just wished I wasn't in that scenario, in that place. But in this particular episode, we're going to be looking at loving our enemies. Have you ever got to that point in life where you just want to give up on people? Whether it be people in the workplace, people you have to deal with, even people within your own family. In this episode, we're going to look at some of the people that I met who I just wished I was at least 100 kilometres away from, because some of these people wanted to kill me. There is a really awkward place that we often find ourselves in with relationships as to when we start talking about loving our enemies of on one hand, we should perhaps remove ourselves from toxic situations, from toxic people. On the other hand, we should perhaps at the same time extend ourselves in love to forgive our brother or sister 77 times. So we're in this place in between and there is just to make a finer point on this from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I think find ourselves agreeing with that last bit quite well. If we have an enemy, I mean a genuine enemy, we all know who those people are. We don't mind when we get to that point, not that we necessarily go through that process all the time or we give people that, that benefit. I wanna talk about those moments when there is an opportunity to extend ourselves, when we continue to love our enemies, even if we do have to put some gap between us and them. Again yesterday, three days behind schedule. Had a monster day yesterday and a fairly big day today. So I'm about two and a half days behind schedule now. And with another big day tomorrow, I'll hopefully be back to about two days behind schedule. And then begin to make my way uh, back to being on schedule. It's very important that I get on schedule. I only have about uh, less than 60 days, less than two months before I have to be on the plane back to Australia for World Youth Day. So my, my flight is booked and it leaves on the 11th of July, which is a day, one day ahead of schedule actually, so technically I'm probably four days behind. Hello. Maybe I could just get one of them. I was walking 40 kilometres between two towns, El Tigre and Paraguay in Venezuela. I sat down halfway at the 20 kilometre mark to eat my lunch, middle of nowhere, and behind me, sneaking up very quietly, was a farmer with a shotgun. The guy was stealth. I had no idea he was there. The first thing I knew of him was a very faint, boy. I swung around and had the shotgun pushed into my head. He cocked it, put his finger on the trigger, and was frantic. He was shaking so much that the gun actually jackhammered me in the side of the head a few times. I leapt up off the ground. My lunch went flying. And I was blurting out in Spanish, 
everything that I could to try and calm the situation down. Because he's shaking so much and his finger is on the trigger of the loaded shotgun. So, hands in the air, blurting out in Spanish, everything to calm the situation down. At one point though, he, he called me some not so nice terms, but he called me a gringo. I replied, no soy gringo, I'm not a gringo. He says, soy australiano, I'm Australian. No joke, his head popped up from over the gun. He just stared at me and said, Australia. And then in Spanish continued with, you have a lot of farms in Australia. I've seen them on Discovery Channel. He'd watched those documentaries. And I just said to him, see, sí, see, sí. I said, I'm, I, I'm from a farm myself. He says, what sort of cows have you got? I said, uh, Angus, black Angus. And he goes, oh, we've got Angus too. Good cows, aren't they? Good cows. He's got a gun up my head. And we're now talking about how good black Angus cows are. And I said to him, look, I am no threat to you, your family. Put the gun down. And at that point, he said to me, what are you doing here? And I just said to him, I'm a Catholic missionary. I'm walking around the world praying for the unity of the church. With the gun at my head, he took his finger off the trigger and while cradling the shotgun, tapped himself on the chest and said, I'm a Catholic too. I said, good on you. I don't care. Put the gun down. I am no issue to you or your family. And he did. He lowered the gun and he apologised. And he said, oh, I'm sorry if I scared you. No, you look like a gringo. He said, it's going to be difficult for you here. I'm glad you made it this far though. That didn't exactly fill me. I was only a little bit into Venezuela. Didn't fill me with great encouragement for a country that is averaging 52, 54 murders a day. The adrenaline's pumping pretty much right now. I said, I think I might just walk on. He said, oh, okay. Where are you walking to? So the easiest way to tell him where I was walking was to pull my itinerary out and then just hand it to him. And he opened my itinerary up and he, he flicked through where I'd walked through and he picked the towns. He knew the very places I'd walked through as far as whether they were going to be good or dangerous. He picked the very towns and he said, how'd you go in those towns? I said, ah, yeah, a few people tried to kill me. People trying to stone me to death, threatening me with weapons. He said, yeah, he said, I, I wouldn't even go to those towns. Really dangerous. He said, police don't go to those towns. He looked at where I was going from there. He looked at where I was going from there and he, he gave me some good advice. And he said, look, these next few towns are fantastic. If they're beautiful people, they'll look after you. And he was right, they did. He handed me my itinerary back and just said, all the best with the journey. I, I hope it goes well for you. I said, thank you. We actually shook hands. I packed my gear up and I, I walked on down the road. As I walked off, he put the gun under his arm and started walking back down across the paddock towards his house. I got about 30 or 40 metres on down the road and I thought I should take advantage of this. So I turned back and yelled out to him, Senor, Senor, para, sir, sir, stop. He turned back at me and I said, that's a really nice gun you have. Is it okay? Can I take a photograph of you and the gun? He didn't say anything. He just went and stood there like this posing with his shotgun. I walked back down the road, took my backpack off, undid it, took the camera out, fired the camera up. He's just waiting patiently with his shotgun, took his photograph, and as soon as I took it, he says, show me, show me. And I turned the LCD screen around of the camera and showed him the photograph, and he goes, oh, cool, cool. Okay, one more, one more. Within the space of two minutes, he went from being willing to kill me to posing for his portrait. Each of us has a very difficult journey ahead of us. It can be quite slippery, it can be quite up and down. There are moments where we just want to be aggressive. And there are moments when we do need to stand our ground. There are moments when those around us do, out of love, need to be rebuked. But we've got to be careful here because the rebuking isn't to make us 
feel better. To rebuke someone else is out of love for their soul to be saved, that they would repent. We are called to love, to love our enemies, to lay our lives down for one another. And to this day, I am nothing but grateful to that farmer in Venezuela, because I know too many people who when they get into that situation, there's no way they back down. And in that moment when they realise they are wrong, they'll just bluff their way forward from there. The humility that he showed to go from having a gun up against my head to then realising, oh, he's not a threat and actually apologising and inviting me to sit back down and eat my lunch. That took extraordinary humility. It's very difficult to love our enemies. This guy, I got to within uh, about a metre, I reckon. I put my foot. I was very close to him. I put my foot about where that crack is. Kind of expect that there will be a few snakes around here. You've got fairly tall grass going on this side, the drain there, and then out to this side, we've got uh, rice paddies filled with water, which would generally mean there's uh, a lot of frogs and tadpoles and insects and stuff, so the snakes are going to enjoy this. This is sort of their territory. I'll, I'll walk fast and in the middle of the road. <laughs> I think that was only a grass snake, and as I believe, they aren't particularly dangerous. Um, and I like them though anyway. <laughs> With relationships, I'm often reminded of a beautiful, beautiful moment in southern France. Now, what happened was I walked into a small village called Saint-Gilles. I couldn't see any churches. The village itself was built on the side of a hill and I was tired. It was a long, hot, humid day. I wanted to get to a hotel as quickly as I could. So I walked up to Rohan and in my very poor French, simply said to him, uh, Je suis Australien. I'm Australian. Now that was my way of saying, very sorry, I don't speak French particularly well. That, but that was my introduction. And I asked him, are there any churches here in the village? Well, Rohan stood up with his little walking stick. Rohan was only just taller than my hip. He was tiny. He was about 80 years of age. And he looked up at me and simply said, oui, oui, yes, yes. There is one church here in this village, but he said, it's too difficult to describe how to get there. He said, come on, I'll walk you. And no joke, at this pace, Rohan walked me up the side of that hill. I had to walk so slowly beside him that in fact, every step I took landed me a full step ahead of him. 
I had to bring my feet together, wait for him to catch up, take another step, bring my feet together and do this up the hill. And I was already really tired. This was, it was almost torturous. Well, Rohan chatted away up this hill that we walked up through the village. We stopped halfway up the hill through this alleyway because he'd become asthmatic. He was wheezing badly. I actually, I took his photograph at that point and he, he did stop wheezing and smile for his photograph. And he laughed at me that he said, as a child, he said, I, I used to run up this hill. He said, now I can't even walk up it. But he said, oh, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there eventually. We continued on our way and we made it up to the top of the hill where there was a church, accommodation was organised for me. Rohan shook my hand, looked up at me and said, all the best with the mission, keep going. Turned and walked around back down the village, back down the alleyway, through the village, back down to his bus stop. Couldn't find the church, could now, yeah, the bell's ring. And uh, this is Rohan. And Rohan has uh, pointed me in the right direction. It was up a bit of a maze through quite a few different uh, little alleyways. And uh, he's a little bit short of breath at the moment, heading up the hill. <laughs> The next village I arrived in, the same thing happened. This time it was a 15 year old named Dorian. And Dorian, when I asked her, is there any, not any churches? This time I'd found the church, I couldn't find a hotel. She walked me a kilometre and a half. Rohan had walked me a kilometre up that hill. Dorian walked me a kilometre and a half. We found accommodation and at this accommodation, she paid for it, turned around, kissed me on the cheek and said, merci, thank you, and turned and walked away. Never seen her again. The next village, the same thing happened with a new person. And at that point, I then turned to a local who I just randomly ended in conversation with and I said, what is going on? Like, why is everyone here so unbelievably friendly? Why are they so nice to me? And he looked at me as though I'd just made the stupidest comment on the face of the planet. And he said, did your parents never tell you what your grandparents did for us? I said, uh, oh, you mean the war? He said, yes, I mean the war. He said, this region, this is where World War I the front line was. He said, we were under attack in World War II as well. And your grandparents, your great grandparents, they fought alongside us. We owe our freedom to them. We owe our freedom to you. He said, that's why everyone's nice to you. They're, still, they're saying thank you. It was pointed out to me sometime later that in fact, across a lot of the train stations, he didn't just say the town name. He didn't just say Montpellier. It also said, do not forget Australia. I've often wondered what Rohan would have done had I introduced myself as German. I am quarter German. I'm part Aboriginal, I'm, my surname is Irish, but I am quarter German. And I wonder what had happened in each of those places had I introduced myself as German, as the enemy. I was a friend. So the extent they went for me to say thank you was extraordinary. And I am exceptionally grateful for the thank you they gave me for something I didn't do. My great, great uncle died on his first day in World War I in France. So the thank you does mean something. But I often wonder if we can take it even further that every single person we meet, it's not that we're recognising them as Australian, as a friend. We recognise each other as sons and daughters of God.
as brothers and sisters of God. And that no matter who this person is, in some way we would walk that extra mile. We would walk with them that extra mile. We would give them that extra cloak. It's quarter past nine in the morning, but it's actually getting darker over the last half an hour. The, uh, the clouds have thickened. It's pouring with rain in the background and there's a bit of lightning around. And it's just got very, very dark. It's probably not showing up on the camera. The camera's got a, well, it automatically tries to even everything out. So it's probably showing up a bit lighter than it actually is. But it feels like it's 9.30 at night, not 9 and 9.15 in the morning. I doubt that I'll make it through today without getting saturated. With the story of the Good Samaritan from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? We do it day in, day out. Who is my neighbour? Who is it that I should love? And who is it that I should ignore? Who is it that I should put a gun to their head? Who is it that I should pray for out of love or ignore completely? We're called to love our enemies. And if we can't, pray for the grace to. Holy Father, we thank you for the gifts of love. We thank you, Lord God, for the wisdom to be able to discern right and wrong through the gift of your Holy Spirit. We pray, pray, Lord God, you would please bless us with courage to lovingly rebuke those around us who are leading themselves or those around them astray, to be patient with them. And when we are rebuked, to have the humility, thank that person who has rebuked us, but then to fully turn back to you, to repent. We pray, Father, for the courage to love our enemies. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our next episode, we're going to be looking at how our faith grows through trusting God and just how incredibly trustworthy God is. Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.